With the exception of a beautiful gay male Swede, Anders, who had some journalism chops and wrote the digests of the project's leaks, the division of labor by gender was perfect. The boys went to a windowless and heavily secured building beyond the goat pasture and wrote code there, while the girls hung out in the refurbished barn and did community development and PR and search engine optimization, source verification and liaising, website and bookkeeping chores, research and social media and copywriting. To a person, they had backgrounds more fascinating than Pip's. They were Danish and British and Ethiopian, Italian and Chilean and Manhattanite, and they appeared to have spent their college years not going to class. They had already read and reread Ulysses at 12 while attending private academies for the super gifted. But taking semesters off from Brown or Stanford to fabulously work for Sean Combs or Elizabeth Warren, combat AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa, or sleep with college dropout founders of billion dollar Silicon Valley startups. Pip saw that the Sunlight Project couldn't possibly be creepy or cultish because the other young women weren't the kind who made mistakes. Jonathan Franzen is often said, and you've said that in the past, in a way, you've disdained the internet, but it seems with purity, you have absolutely dived headlong into the internet. Uh, one way or another, yes, for better and worse. Um, yeah, it's... Um, the new novel is a book about secrets, in part, and uh, it's hard to tell a story about secrets that's set in the present and not get into the internet. Um, and people have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of anxiety in the air about identity and secrets. And that is all driven by uh, the internet phenomenon, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, there's a triumvirate. You, in the book, you uh, mention a uh, new name check, Edward Snow, new name check, Assange. And here we have Andreas Wolf, who starts the Sunlight Project in Bolivia. Tell me about, uh, about Andreas Wolf. Well, it's, it's possible to imagine that his Sunlight Project is distinctly different from uh, both what Assange did and certainly from what Snowden did. Um, he's in the market for secrets large and small, uh, and he has secrets of his own. He comes out of East Germany. He has a dark past in East Germany, and he, he became uh, an exposer of other people's secrets more or less by accident. He seized the moment uh, to expose the Stasi, even though he was kind of in bed with the Stasi himself. He does a very funny thing, though, and it's actually quite an exposure of mainstream media because what happens is, in order to, he's at the Stasi archive, <laughs> in order to make his escape, he just goes and stands in front of a television Nothing crew. Nothing can happen to you when you're in front of a television camera. Exactly, exactly. exactly. He's but got all... a little plastic bag with some very damning documents in them, and uh, <laughs> no one can lay a hand on them. But it may be professional jealousy on his part, but he refers to Assange as that autistic megalomaniac sex creep. Yes. You don't mince your words. Well, no, I mean, I'm not suggesting that you think that. Um, that's right. Well, there, there are rivalries among these leakers. And if you imagine that an Andreas existed, he would be very, very unhappy with how much attention his rival is getting. So I also quit my job, she said, when they'd eaten dinner and the wine was nearly gone. Good for you, her mother said. That job never sounded worthy of your talents. Mom, I have no talents. I have useless intelligence and no money, and now no place to live. You can always live with me. Let's try to be realistic. You can have the sleeping porch back. You love the sleeping porch. Pip poured the last of the wine into her glass. Moral hazard allowed her to simply ignore her mother when she felt like it. So here's what I'm thinking, she said. Two possibilities. One, you help me find my other parents so I can try to get some money out of him. The other is I'm thinking of going to South America for a while. If you want me to stay around here, you have to help me find the missing parent. Her mother's posture, fortified by her endeavor, was as beautifully vertical as Pip's was crappy and slouched. A faraway look was coming over her, almost a different kind of face altogether, a younger face. It could only be, Pip thought, the face of the person she'd once been before she was a mother. Looking into the now dark window by the table, her mother said, not even for you will I do that. So uh, the book opens with uh, the story of Pip uh, and her uh, relationship with the mother and the secrets therein. Yes. Um, that, is, that is a kind of very big secret. Tell me about that secret. 
Well, it's, uh, the, the premise of the book is vaguely 19th century. Here's a young woman who's been brought up by her mother in a cabin in the mountains in California and uh, knows that her mother has changed her identity and the mother won't tell her who she is and certainly won't say who her father is. And uh, because Pip is poor and in debt and imagines that the father has more money than she does, he could hardly have less, she is determined to find out who he is. And that's the 19th century setup mm -hmm. that then meets the 21st century of the internet. But uh, in the relationship between Pip and her mother, um, she recycles something she's learned at university, which you do very cleverly in the book. You do that thing about ascribing ideas to people and then they transfer them to their own lives. You talk about moral hazard. Moral hazard, yes. Well, I'm sure we've heard a lot about moral hazard here in England too. Uh, uh, Citibank uh, would be a great example of moral hazard. Uh, I believe the line for Pip is, she was like a bank too big in her mother's economy to fail, or alternatively, a, an employee too indispensable to be fired for having a bad attitude. Um, because she is all her mother has, her mother is utterly dependent on her, and she can really treat her mother quite badly as a result. It seems though that in the book, um, a number of the women kind of suffer, they're the kind of collateral damage of the male characters? Oh, yes and no. I mean, there is at the center of the book a, uh, an investigative journalist, a Lebanese-American woman named Lila, who's a strong professional woman who probably inflicts more damage than she receives, uh, I would say. Um, she wrecks a marriage and is in a complicated relationship with both her ex-husband and her longtime employer. Um, uh, Pip, I don't think, is collaterally damaged. Pip is just kind of finding her way through the world and becoming morally implicated herself. She makes bad choices. Um, she chooses to lie to her employers. She chooses to spy for Andreas, all of these things. Uh, and finally, the, the third female main character is uh, a woman named Annabelle. Um, she's a rich girl who disavows her wealth and has these very, very absolute notions of moral purity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure she's victimized either. You could say that it was bad luck for the boy who she set her eyes on. You could say. But at the heart of this book, it's not really about the internet. It seems to me, as your other books are, it is about family and often the failure of family and often the failure of the nuclear family. This is my first novel that doesn't have a nuclear family to speak of in it. It's these little fragments. There is no intact marriage. There is no stable arrangement of father, mother who is married or in a secure relationship and child. It's all dyads, uh, typically between mother and a child. And um, that was partly because I was sick of being called a family novelist and I wanted to explode it. Um, there's also a certain realism to it. Uh, more and more people I know uh, come from or have non-traditional family arrangements. Um, and, uh, and, and it enabled me to get away from group dynamics and really bore in on the kind of psychological violence that mm -hmm can characterize very close relationships between a parent and a child. And indeed, there is more than one very damaging psychological relationship in this book between a, a mother and a child. I think there's really only one seriously damaging one, which is the uh, Andreas's mother is kind of crazy and uh, safe to say recognizes no boundaries. Recognizes absolutely no boundaries, but you might also say that uh, Pip's mother inflicts un unnecessarily unknowing to her psycho potentially psychological damage on her daughter by refusing to divulge identity, by refusing to give anything except you know, all-embracing love. Well, that's quite a lot, all-embracing love, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, and uh, all-embracing love that you believe is sincere, mm -hmm. you can pretty much do everything else wrong and the child's probably going to be okay. Um, so I don't think of Pip as so much damaged as frustrated and trapped. Uh, her mother needs her desperately and Pip's all she has and that's, that's, that's an anguish but I don't see it as a damage. You were talking about realism there and I think that also what this book, you, you very successfully demonstrate in this book, how everybody is capable of both good behaviour and bad behaviour. 
Thank you for saying that. There are absolutely no flawless characters, nor in, in life is there a flawless character. I'm sure the Pope's not even flawless, but you know. I hear the Pope just <laughs> met with, with what's her face, the clerk, Kim Davis or whatever her name was, the clerk from the, the, the homophobic clerk <laughs> yes. from a southern state. Yes, but I think that whole idea that, um, that we don't even know sometimes we're doing bad when we're doing it. Um, or we don't think we're doing as badly as we are. Uh, f f fiction of all kinds is inevitably concerned with people behaving well and people mm. behaving badly, with good and evil, if you want to call it that. And um, the kind of fiction I'm interested in and enjoy uh, always complicates who's good and mm. who's bad. Um, uh, you run the risk of people saying, oh, your none of your characters are nice or they're, I can't sympathize because they do bad things. And I always want to ask, like, have you never done a bad thing? Have you never made a mistake? Um, so, yeah, I'm glad, glad you see it. It was all mixed up. Um, in the book also, there is an outsider's idealistic vision of America. Anyway, you know, basically, uh, Andreas Wolf asks Anna Gret in, East Ger in, in Germany, to go to America to do something for him. And she's reluctant to go. And she says, I thought Obama would change things, but it's still just guns, drones, and Guantanamo. Are you sort of satirizing the kind of idealistic vision that people had of what Obama might do? It's a throwaway line, really. Um, there is a reflexive anti-Americanism in the liberal precincts of Northern Europe and Annegret is a minor character who is absolutely one of those Northern European liberals. Um, and, you know, as soon as she gets to America, what she wants to do is be photographed in front of murals in the ghetto to prove that she was in an American ghetto and to demonstrate solidarity. So there's a certain, it's, uh, you know, the point of that was not really to satirize, it was just to recognize how funny these Europeans are when they get to America. Um, on the other side, there's, uh, there's Lila, the, um, the journalist mm -hmm. who is in Texas, where she comes from, and she's talking about Amarillo, Texas is possibly the most horrible place in the world, representing everything that's wrong with America, mm -hmm. um, at least as the rest of the world sees it, and yet she can't help it, she loves it, mm -hmm. um, because she's a Texan. And Texans are special. Texans are special. Tex Texans are special. But, I, but just talking about politics just now, I wonder what you make of Bernie Sanders. I mean, I'd be interested to know. Uh, he's okay. He's okay. Uh, I think he's not really electable. Um, but then is Donald Trump electable? Well, it would be an interesting race, wouldn't it? That would be a very, very interesting race. That would be two very clear choices. Um, which, if you follow Ralph Nader's logic, would be a step forward for the American electoral process. Uh, instead of two vaguely centrist people with almost identical policies to have two radically different visions of America, that would be a treat. Um, but we'll probably end up with Jeb Bush uh, against Hillary Clinton, and it'll be the same old, same old. What do you think of this idea of this kind of dynastic urge in America? That, you know, you eschew monarchy, but you you know, you have a big revolution and you fight a big war, and then what you do is you bring in dynasties. Um, well, yes, that goes all the way back to John Adams and John Quincy Adams, uh, who, you know, father and son, presidents. Um, uh, yes. Uh, um, I would point out that it's still not a, mo a monarchy. <laughs> we no. don't have a titled aristocracy. Um, there are certain structural reasons uh, that uh, a name becomes a brand and that the brand attracts big money. Mm -hmm. So what, what it's, it seems to be actually less about dynasty in my view than about the way money works mm -hmm. in American politics and who can raise the money and there the, the dynasty thing comes into play. Mm -hmm. Um, not, not because of a, I, th I think people actually, Americans really are anti-monarchist yes, um, and fairly hostile to uh, traditional aristocracy. So I don't, I, I don't think people like it. It's just the way the money thing works. You have a kind of, a kind of big beast in the novel or potentially a kind of old big beast of Charles Blenheim 
who is your kind of the, 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 the novelist that is really yes. in search of his big book. Yes. Very funny. Um, yes. <laughs> Haven't we all met someone like Charles Blenheim? Haven't we all met someone he like... He had his big chance and it didn't quite work out and he's now consumed with envy and, and rage. Yes. Um, and yet, uh, I found him very touching myself. Um, if you, you know, they're difficult to be with in person, but you can certainly feel where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Every writer has experienced envy. You can't be a fiction writer if you've never felt envious of another fiction writer. And are you envious of any particular fiction writer? Me personally yeah. now? Not so much. Um, no, I'm not envious. But there is a little twinge when you see someone else get a prominent review. It mm -hmm. does call to mind Gore Vidal's Something in Me Dies When a Friend Succeeds. Um, it, it's, it's just a passing moment. I'm not consumed by envy, certainly. But Charles is, Charles because he is, says yes. words to the effect, and I haven't written them all down, but he's talking about the literary scene in America, you see. So many Jonathans, a plague of literary Jonathans. I mean, one assumes you're poking fun at yourself. A little bit, yes. Um, but not but completely. The thing is, I, um, I'm an ex... Uh, I think I feel like an increasingly extreme writer. I'm drawn to extreme situations and to extreme psychological states that verge on violence. Mm -hmm. um, and to make that work, I try to root um, as much as I can of the book in comedy and in realism. And the fact is that an embittered novelist in his 60s surveying the literary scene behind him would be probably very focused on me and the other Jonathan writers uh, who were younger than him. And so it was mere realism, actually. <laughs> but the idea, I mean, this, this idea that there is this great American novel, I mean, this, you've been tagged with this for so long, does it just get tedious? Yes, although I... I uh, as time goes by, I get better and better at closing out the noise. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a striking thing. I, I, I'm on a long tour, I, and I do the tours not because I have to, but because I like them, because I like meeting readers, mm -hmm. because readers are the only people I really care about in the world. Um, nobody ever brings up the great American novel. It's a journalistic construction. It's a convenience uh, and seems to have meaning to the journalists and the editors. But it's, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a category for readers. Readers are just looking for something good. They're just looking for a great story. Yeah. But in the construction of this great story, what you have is seven interlocking sections. And I remember in the past talking to you back at the corrections and you were talking about and I always imagined this as like some kind of hermetically sealed ship container that you went into in Manhattan, you know, closed out the light, closed out the noise, put the headphones on, took the Ethernet cable out and sat and wrote. And do you still do that? Because there is, there is an intensity in the book that I feel has to come from that level of concentration. Yes. Yeah. It's not that I'm, I don't spend time on the internet after hours, but there's a period from when I go to sleep at 11, 11.30 at night to when I leave the office the following day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when I've just been, it, it's been dark and I've been half asleep in a good way. Uh, and then I come out into the light and spend two hours on email and do any number of internet things. But the, I think there has to be that daily just, it's important for me, at least, to spend more than half the day in a dark, quiet space. Um, and in order to get all of those gyroscopes in the head spinning, um, to, to keep it all in my head for the year it takes to write a novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I miss that state when I'm not in it. I mean, yes. right now I'm far. I couldn't be, yeah, I couldn't be farther from that state right at this particular yeah. moment talking to you, Christy. The, the book, I think, also explores the notion that of recycled ideas and that actually originality is very difficult and that the internet feeds into this. Yeah, the, the, the problem with the internet, as I see it, is it rewards irresponsible discourse and it rewards loud, one-sided, exaggerated, especially tweetable thought. Uh, and it actively penalizes you for 
a nuanced, balanced argument, which always takes some time. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to express a complicated thought, uh, you need to lay out at least two sides and then do some synthesizing at the end. Not only does that not fit in a tweet, but it doesn't get anybody angry. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't get anyone angry, if it doesn't stimulate them, it will not get clicked. And so there is this, I think, self-reinforcing uh, divisiveness to the internet that is implicit in the very economic model that drives it. Well, the book is about the bad things that the internet can throw up, but it's also about the good things. And it seems to me that in the end, without giving too much away, the internet is kind of Pip's salvation. And I wonder if that reflects an optimism that you have now. An optimism about the internet? No, I would be foolish to be optimistic about the internet. I see it as a, a powerful engine for increasing income inequality, for uh, impoverishing content providers, and for lowering the level of public discourse. Uh, and all of that seems to me to be getting worse and worse. Um, nevertheless, you don't write a novel, a good novel, if you have an axe to grind. It's not like I wrote this novel as a denunciation of the internet and again, trying to create balance within a work of a certain length, you have to acknowledge when something good comes of this new um, incredible availability of all information. It cuts both ways and you know, I wouldn't pretend that I don't use the internet to do fact-checking for my books. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a fantastic tool. It's a fantastic tool for bird watching and bird science. It's, um, it's, uh, it can be a good fundraising tool. There are all sorts of things it's good at. Um, what I, what constitutionally as a novelist I have a problem with is people who only talk about the good and don't talk about the bad. Or conversely, you only talk about the bad and not the good. There is, um, there's, a, there's a vast oversimplification going on in the, the hoopla. Um, and I, and I, yes, and I'm particularly aghast at social media, which I think are way, way overhyped and actually quite destructive. So the only tweeting you're ever going to be doing is at birds when you're actually twitching out in the country? Um, it does seem like a particularly grotesque irony that it's called Twitter and uh, that the verb is to tweet, yeah. Jonathan Franzen, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure, Christy.